Hi, I'm Jonah McTavish Slayton, and welcome to my channel. Today, I'm going to take you on a photo tour of a road trip from west of Scotland, leaving the Isle of Skye, all the way through the central part of Scotland to Stirling. Now, this video may of interest you if you have Scottish ancestry or heritage like I do, or if you're just interested in Scottish history as well. Now, some of these spots we're going to look at um, are very touristy and some not so touristy. But as I said, if you've never been to Scotland, these are great spots to visit. Or even if you've been to Scotland and you've never been to these spots, it's great to visit. So we take our journey um, from the Isle of Skye. Now, we came up through, El went to Elidun Castle, we went into uh, um, the Glenfinnan Monument. We went to some different things on this trip, this particular trip to Scotland. And this is coming back. Um, we spent several days on Isle of Skye and seen everything on the Isle of Skye. Um, and this is coming back. So we're back in the mainland and we're, we're stopped at a few spots. Our main destination is um, Stirling. Um, and then we'd, we would take this trip to Stirling, which was uh, we left early in the morning, probably about 6 a.m. in the morning. And by the time we got to Stirling, I, I believe it was roughly around um, probably 4 or 5 o'clock. Now, the journey doesn't take near that long, but we stopped at several spots. And each stop was about, some of it was as, as um, short as 30 or 40 minutes. Some of it was, um, uh, you know, over an hour. So, without further ado, we're going to go and begin our look at... The pictures. All right. So this is um, us getting up. This is the beautiful Isle of Skye. I'm not going to show you any of those gorgeous pictures, but this is leaving the Isle of Skye. We're headed back toward the mainland. It has such an ambient feeling to it. The mist um, coming through the, the mountains and just the contrasting greens and oranges um, and... The sunlight coming through. I'm pretty sure I was listening to um, some Jacob Bike music or something, but it was just an incredible morning to um, take off for a road trip. Um, and this is um, Glen Shill. Now, Glen Shill is important for um, people that have Highlander ancestry, such as myself, because this was a battle in West Scotland between the Jacobites and the loyalist and, uh, of the British Army. So this is kind of like in America where the patriots and the colonial, the colonial, the colonists went against the Redcoats. Well, uh, kind of the same thing. The Jacobites would be mostly these Highlander clansmen that were um, resisting British control, Redcoat patrol, and, and they were wanting to put Bonnie Prince... Um, Charles, you know, restored the line of Stuart to the throne of Britain, which would have been their king here, there in Scotland. So this is a picture around. Um, we just got out and walked the trail. Um, this this is a very sacred place. If you um, have Highlander uh, heritage, because many of Highlanders lost their lives here. Um, and there's the hill path, and we walked it. I actually just put my camera away. Now I take a lot of pictures, but w it was just so serene with the with the fog coming down and the mist. And you know, it actually along the trail we began walking in the mist, so really wasn't a lot of good pictures. Um, this is right before we walked to the show, uh, the trail. There's me and my Norse Gaelic pickish beard. Um, back when it was mostly red. Uh, then we left that, um, and then we would go through um, Faltergal and Hargari. Um, welcome to Unvergari. And so we're going to go to Inverlochy Castle. Uh, now this is a ruins. It's pretty cool, but sadly it is in pretty bad shape, the castle is. 
This castle was built, I believe, sometime in the 1200s by the Komen family. Now, you may recognize the Komen family from the Scottish Wars of Independence. And there it is. Welcome to Inverlochy Castle. Falchigal Calestil Inverlochre. Um, and, like, yeah, it was built in 1280 by John Coleman. And commanded the strategic southern entrance to the Great Glen. Um, and then there's the artist's rendition of what the castle would have looked like with a moat all the way around it. So this was a moat castle, so it had water all the way um, around the, its, its um, boundaries. And as I said, you can look up into the middle of the picture and you see that they're doing a little bit of um, restoration work while we were there. But unfortunately, this castle is in great run, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. This is this castle is in a very strategic spot, guarding the mouth of the of the glen there. So we're going to get through this, and here's why this castle is important um, at home with the Comans. And and the reason why is that. John Coleman had a claimant to the throne of Scotland. And who else had a throne claimant to the kingship of Scotland? Well, yes, everyone knows John's biggest opponent would be Robert de Bruce. Now, Robert de Bruce is, is my 21st great-grandfather on my mother's side and 21st um, or something great-grandfather on my father's side. Okay, so we've got Bruce lines both lines in from the Stuarts. And I also have an Edward the Bruce line, which is through a different um, grandmother married into the family. But this castle, the, the Colemans would lose their power. They were one of the greatest uh, families in all of Scotland. And that's because they intermarried within the, the, um, the, the, the Gallic kings of Scotland. So, I believe they were married to probably, I can't remember exactly, but much like uh, Robert de Bruce, um, John Com um, Coleman's family was married into, I think, William the Lion, the King of Scotland, you know, David's, um, King David's grandson, or maybe it was Alexander, one of the Ag Alexander the III's, um, second, someone during that time period, not, you know, too too long before the Wars of Independence. But anyway, so we know that supposedly Robert the Bruce murdered um, Coleman, and this sparked a kind of this animosity in um, the Highlands. Now, my family is made up of um, three branches, um, and the Mac Tavishes actually supported Robert the Bruce. And I'm not sure... Um, you know, the relationship with the Comans and the McTavishes. But the McTavishes supported uh, Robert the Bruce. The Comans, um, you know, obviously there was clans that supported them. And one of the clans that supported them was the MacDougals. Now, the MacDougals is my great-grandmother. And they supported the Coleman, you know, John Coleman, while the McTavish supported Robert the Bruce. Um, and if you go back further, um, my great-great-grandmother was a McGregor. Now, I'm not sure who the McGregors served, but they would have been at the top of the game as far as uh, patriotic Scots fighting for their freedom, fighting with William Wallace and Andrew Morey. Um, but I'm not sure if the McGregors sided with who, but I do know the McDougals sided with the Comans. So not only did the Comans lose their power and lose this castle, and I believe once Robert the Bruce won, uh, or after the murder of, um, and I, I don't think it's a murder, you know, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up there. I don't think Robert the Bruce went to meet John Coleman with all intentions to murder him. You know, I believe, I think the movie um, that that they played, it, you know, because Robert the Bruce is actually the true Braveheart, but in, in the movie, they, they portray him being, you know, cornered. And really set up. And I kind of, in a way, believe there was some... I think I think there might have been something like that. But 
Maybe not, but I, I believe Robert the Bruce didn't go there with intention to murder him, but I think that he was insulted and they probably got in a fight and sure, Robert the Bruce is going to protect himself um, and I believe it was probably both men engaging each other equally and Robert got the upper hand. Now, this put a mark on him and the Comans and all the clans that supported him were, were on him, including the McDougals. And the McDougals, you know, like I said, my great-grandparent, uh, grandmother was McDougal. And this would later lead to them losing most of their um, wealth and lands being confiscated. So that's the importance of uh, the ca uh, castle here at Inverlochy. And here's just some more pictures around it. And like I said, the castle's in, 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 in a pretty bad shape um this was a this was several years back i believe maybe in 2017 2016 this gives you a little bit more about how they controlled the river locky um and in the, the great glen So this is a pretty cool castle. I mean, probably not a big tourist spot, but because this was um, John Coleman's castle, and this is probably the most famous murder, or supposedly murdered, in Scottish history with Robert the Bruce, I thought it was well worth the stop. And the fact that the McDougals supported the Comans, and this is part of my family history, that Robert the Bruce, and they would um, actually go after Robert the Bruce, but Robert the Bruce in the end would have his revenge and the family would no longer be the great powerful family located um, around the Oban area in Ariel. All right. Plenty of pictures. And there is Shannon. There's myself. All right, we're leaving. We're leaving Inverlochy Castle, and we're going across Western Scotland. And now we're getting into one of the most beautiful parts of Scotland. Now this is a very touristy area because it is Glencoe. Glencoe is very very beautiful and these pictures don't really do it quite justice because there was a pretty heavy overcast that day so as you can see oh uh, i want to point out one thing that nearly all my pictures that i take abroad whether it's with my iphone or whatever i don't doctor them i don't do anything to them so you'll see some really pretty pictures coming up they're really gorgeous pictures in certain points and that is just natural light coming in i have really not very talented with you know, opening shutters and 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 adjusting my lenses and everything. This is a this was taken, I think, with uh, my Olympus camera. It's about a mid-range camera. It's not an expensive camera by any means. Um, so, but it, it did a pretty good job. But there was an overcast, and if I was talented enough to know how to operate the camera, I probably could have taken better pictures. Um, there I am eating some kind of. Goody. But like I said, none of these pictures have been any type of filtered or altered. They were just snapped. Um, and there was there was a pretty pretty heavy overcast. But I still think it's captured the the beauty of Glencoe. The one thing I love about this is that these these bends or mountains are not particularly high. Um, here in the States, if you go to um, Colorado or Wyoming or Utah or Montana, the mountains are three times the height of these mountains. These mountains are typically about four to 5,000 feet versus, you know, 14, 15,000 feet mountains in Colorado or Montana. But you're already about a mile to three-fourths of a mile up by the time you get to the mountain. And the peaks typically are only about 3,000 feet at the at the baseline. Versus here in Scotland, 
these mountains, th these roads are very close to almost probably sea level. You're, so you're we're probably only a, a few hundred feet above sea level going through these glens, these valleys. So when you're looking up at the bends or the mountains that go up 4,000 feet from baseline up, they really look a lot larger in person. And you would think they were, you know, very, very tall. Nevertheless, they're very beautiful. There's a little small lock. And this was a, this is really, and like I said, this is I've told you this was a touristy area. Now there's a couple parts around Glen Glow that I could take you to. And we've been through here before. And I just wanted to stop because you have to stop and take pictures anytime you drive through here unless you live and go through there every day. But, you know, for someone coming over from Texas, it's it's extraordinary and, and I'll never not take a picture of something. Now there are some very cool spots that you can get to that you don't have all the crowds of the tourists. But this is, you know, like I said, the, these shots I'm showing are, are probably more famous of the shots. The one thing I notice is there's there's a few small waterfalls. So after a heavy rain, um, those waterfalls are, are very much more moving, very more dramatic to the landscape and, and brilliant. Also coming out of springtime, you know, when the um, snow, you know, these this area get these these peaks and um, bins get covered with snow. When that melt off runs off, the the waterfalls through here on the sides of them are quite magnificent. They're they're larger. Now this time right here, we're going in. I believe it was in September, so we're heading toward uh, autumn, toward fall, and so there's not as as much water runoff. But you can see from where these people are on the trail down at the very lowest point to the top, that's a quite of an uh, ascent. And it makes it very um, striking. And there's so many different ways to capture um, the these peaks and, and, and cliffs through the glens right here at Glengoe. I mean, there's just so much... Now that's, so we went through two stops right now. Inverlochy Castle, which is famous because it is the um, ancestral castle to the famous Coleman family. And we know that by Robert the Bruce and his feud. Then we went through the famous Glen Cole, which is probably one of the most famous highland um, landscape sceneries. And now we're going to um, the grave of Rob Rory McGregor. This is at Balwitter. Okay, so the one thing that, you know, most people in America that they think of Rob Rory McGregor, they, they think of the movie, right? Which the movie took a lot of advantages and it's not entirely accurate, but it's semi-accurate. Now, I didn't really come here because they made a movie off of a guy by the name of Rob Rory McGregor. I came here because I have a McGregor great-great-grandparent. Now... I'm not kin to Rob Rory McGregor directly, but I'm sure that these people that were found in this area um, where Rob Rory McGregor lived, he was part of that clan. And part of that clan is my great-great-grandmother. So we are kin to the same family line. But this is uh, this is the Kirk there at, at Bellwitter. Um, you see the, the high cross Celtic High Cross. And this is, yeah, like I said, this is Bill Ritter Kirkyard. Uh, it says this this Christianity was brought to this glen by St. Angus, who was an ancient uh, whose ancient stone effigy now stands in the Kirk. Um, the first church on the site was built by the Celtic abbot um, some 800 years ago. Um, Lurin. The clan McLaren, the original clan of the district, took their uh, patronomic surname from Lurin. Uh, and then going down here, in the 1500s, uh, the McGregors driven out of their original holdings in Argyll by the Candle Campbells. So even though my McTavish family married a McGregor, this was 300 years later, 400 years later, um, they were originally neighbors are very close in proximity. The uh, McGregors were in more northern Argyll, 
while the McTavish were in Central. But they were driven out by the Campbells, and the, you know the Campbells just caused so much trouble uh, to the Highlanders. The famous uh, McGregor chieftain Rob Rory McGregor um, lived the last years of his turbulent life in the western end of Bowwater Glen. Um, so, this is a pretty interesting place. If you're a fan of the movie, are you are a McGregor, or you have McGregor ancestry or heritage, or you just like history, it's worth a stop. Now, I have didn't see a single person around Bowwater uh, than a couple of locals, but nobody in this graveyard, um, no one around the Oak Kirk, no one down the road. Uh, this place was desolate, and we were there for, like I said, probably a good 45 minutes walking around, maybe an hour walking around and looking at the old kirk and the graves. So here is um, the grave of Robbery McGregor. His grave is going to be in the center with the sword. Um, to his right is his son, and to his left is his um, wife named Helen. And there's an up-close Rob Rory. So there you have the, the centerpiece. It has some kind of um, Gaelic pickish symbol and a sword. And McGregor, despite them. I mean, what an amazing... <laughs> what an amazing clan saying is, despite them. The McGregor surname was outlawed... Um, in Scotland because of their um, nationalistic spirit, their um, drive to be the um, free men. And of course, this put a mark on them which caused them at times to be cattle thief. But I, I think the whole thing about them being cattle thieves is probably overblown. And like many other clans that faced Campbell, you get a tar... Um, feather once you cross them. But I love it, McGregor, despite them. And there I am by it. Now, like I said, there was nobody around. There were several um, cars right there, but they seem to be all going... I, I don't know if there's a restaurant or a pub, but or they may even live there, but like I said, there was nobody down this road. Or in the Kirk. There's me pointing at Rob Rory. And, um... McGregor. Despite them. That's amazing. Some more shots. There's Shannon. And there's the old Kirk. Oh, there's another close-up of, of the grave. Now, the Kirk has... Uh, um, this is the original... Kurt are, I don't know if it's quite quite the original one, but it's the older one that's still standing. It has trees grown, grown right through it. These graves are very interesting. Some of them go back um, to the, the 13, 1400s. Here's a, another McGregor. This is a much later grave. Um, died 1793. That's that's looking toward the New Kirk there. When I say New Kirk, that that was that church was probably built in the um, 1600s, 1700s, maybe. Um, this other church was built much earlier, maybe the you know 1100s, 1200s. Don't quote me on that because I. I I've forgotten. I think I read it on the plaque. Or and there I up there by the by the high cross. But this this is a small little little graveyard beside these two kirks, and you know it, it you know off the main road was you know like a 15 20 minute drive if that um, to Balrutter, and and then you could walk around. Spend 15, 20 minutes or an hour um, exploring, but it's worth it. Uh, and there I am at the sign for the tourist.
And here we are. This is this is one of our routes. We were going to um, Sterling, and there is Sterling Castle. It's one of the oldest castles in the world to still be used. A lot of history of Sterling Castle. Uh, I'm not going to go into it too, too much. Um, you can look it up on the the internet, but this is a very cool castle. It's it's one of my favorite castles because of the massive amount of, of um, history behind the castle and what it means to, to Scotland. And, and then there's the, the church... Um, right outside of it. Fulcher. So you got welcome in Gaelic or Gaelic. And then you got welcome in, I think, German. And then Italian or... No, maybe French. Spanish. Anyways, this is inside of it. Now, I've told you, some of these pictures really pop out. It's almost like I put them into an Instagram filter. But um, no Instagram filter here. This is just the way it captured the grass against the, the castle um, walls. And this is down into kind of like a, a, a grass moat. We didn't go into the castle that this day. I we just walked around the grounds. Um, but it is, is very well worth going in. Now this is a, once you're up there on the wall of the castle, just overlooking the, the countryside is, is incredible. The rampant flying along with St. Andrew's cross. Well, ex excuse me, that's not the rampant. It has something else on it. But this is this is a very touristy spot, and once again, they're doing some restoration on um, one of the the houses inside the castle on the roof. But this definitely is a tourist spot. But if you ever go to Edinburgh or Stirling, you you have to go to Stirling Castle and, and Edinburgh Castle. And, and there he is, my 21st great-grandfather on both my father and my mother's side, the great Robert the Bruce. And, you know, I think I picked up somewhat of his profile. <laughs> Uh, it would be Robert the Bruce that would carry on the work for Scottish independence after Andrew Murray died first, then William the Wallace died. It would be Robert the Bruce that would carry on. Now, probably a lot of this was politically, you know, politically driven. He wanted to be king. He probably wanted to be uh, in this royal line. He wanted his name staked down to history, but. He was very, very much in tune with his um, uh, Gaelic side and through his mother, who was a Countess of Carrick. So I, I think he has, he did find himself reaching out toward the hordes of the Highlanders and the Gaelic spirit of Scotland and this, you know, even further out, the this Galaglass people. But I think he had this true connection and... and Whatever his ambition was, who you know, we I don't think I could judge him because he changed the course of Scotland, and at least Scotland would stay independent, you know, for another um, three hundred years. Uh, and it's just the contrast here with the green versus the the the, the brown walls. And here you go. I mean, it's kind of hard to see, but out in the distance, you see 
uh, the, the Wallace Monument for William Wallace, the tower. So, it's right there on the hill in the middle. Here you can see uh, Canyon. This cannon was um, put here in the rampart. Now, this rampart wasn't designed probably in particular for cannons. Because uh, they didn't have cannons when this castle was built. They didn't come from several, several centuries later when gunpowder was invented. But then they had to modernize it. Put some cannons on the top of the... So, this is Sterling Castle. Very beautiful. Very worth the trip. It is going to be a little bit more touristy. Uh, but you got to go check out the Robert the Bruce statue. Go look at uh, Wallace Monument across Sterling and the countryside. And absolutely go in. I, I didn't show you any pictures to go in because, once again, I, you know, you go into it. There's other things to explore. Uh, this is the graveyard. And probably if you have um, any Scottish ancestry you probably are kin to a few of these folks in this graveyard uh, especially if you're still living in Scotland uh, some very predominant people would be buried here at this graveyard um, it's very well nice set up too with the rows and stuff this is a fancy graveyard we, we looked at um, Rob Rory's graveyard at um, Balwitter and you, you you know it's just a rural country graveyard and that's the kind of graveyard I'd want to be in in, in, in the mountains and in a glen and, and out there with nature and even though sterling it, you know this part of sterling is not overrun with urbanness um uh, it you just see that this is planned out more with the little paths and it's manicured and a lot of famous people buried here at that graveyard um and and right around the corners old town didn't go to old town very much uh because I wanted to look at a few graves before we headed off to our next stop. Uh, but, you know, some very nice architecture um, surrounding the graveyard. And then some of the graves, uh, just the engravings on it and, and, and just the, the artistic value of them is pretty incredible. And, and I believe most of the people in this graveyard, with the stones still standing, were buried, you know, between the 14th and, and 17th century. I'm sorry, the 14th, the 15th to 18th century, the the, the 13 to um, 1700s. I always love these um, grave slabs. This one has cherubs and, you know, angels and the crossbones and it's just, you know, they don't make gravestones like this anymore. This is another picture uh, of Sterling Castle. This is up on the hill um, above the graveyard. And this is down into the graveyard. I would say if you're going to Sterling Castle, though, you need to give yourself a couple of hours. We were probably there maybe 45 minutes. We just walked around the walls and just got the, you know, re revisiting the, 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 the views around the countryside. But if you're going to go, you can do a proper visit. You want to go inside and look at all of the great um, history there. And, and I would say you'd probably need at least two hours. And then you could go down to Old Town, the old part of Sterling, and walk around, and you can see a lot of great uh, old buildings and, and great architect from that time period, and explore graveyards. Uh, my, my wife has, her grandfather was an Anderson on her mother's side, and those Andersons were from Scotland. So, I remember she had a Robert Anderson in her family line, and so I just took a picture of it. Now, this guy is loved by many and hated by as many. This is John Knox. He was a theo, uh, um, he was a minister, he was a theologian, a writer, one of the most predominant men in um, the, the Church of Scotland. The infamous John Knox. 
And I have actually traced my lineage that um, I am kin to some of the Noxus through one of my great-great-grandmothers, like six, seven great-grandmothers back. But this guy wouldn't be very... Um, this wouldn't be a individual that the clansmen would admire, because most of the clansmen would stay Catholic during the Scottish Reformation. So during the time of the Conventor, uh, Conventors and the, the the infamous rednecks, the the scarf wearing red scarf wearing guys, um, the Highlanders wouldn't be friends. And here we have three of these guys that were important of the Church of Scotland, the Protestant Church. Uh, there's Andrew Melville, who was a poet and a writer and a theologian. And there's Alex Henderson. This is another theologian. Uh, and then there is um, Eben Erskine. So, cool little graveyard to take a look at. All right, so we leave the graveyard, the kirkyard, right outside of Stirling Castle, and we're going across, yes, the Stirling Bridge. Now, most people want to come look at this because they've watched the movie Braveheart. That has so much inaccuracy and fakeness about it, it's unbelievable. And Robert the Bruce is actually the true Braveheart in history. He was called that. William Wallace was never called that in history. But William Wallace is badass. He is one of the, you. You talk talk about top ten people I admire in history. It's going to be William Wallace. He's the epitome of what it means to be a real man and to be a real freedom fighter. Um, and so I love the movie. I got to admit, I love Braveheart, even though it is completely wrong. In so many ways, and it paints Robert the Bruce as some bad guy that was indecisive. And so a lot of stuff was completely wrong, but at least they made William Wallace look pretty cool and do some pretty badass stuff. But anyways, going back to that, what made William Wallace, one of the things that made William Wallace famous, along with Andrew Morey. Now, Andrew Morey is another rebel fighter that people don't really know about. And one of the reasons why was William Wallace's death when he was betrayed and imprisoned in England. The way that he was, you know, quartered and dismembered and different body parts put on pikes around Britain. That left a legacy of, um, of memory in William Wallace. It made him bigger than life. It made him a, a, almost a mythical figure. And I love William, but at this very area, right here, is where the Battle of Stirling Bridge happened. And Andrew Murray, up to this point, is probably equal, if not even a more important man than William Wallace. See, William Wallace and him were probably equal, equal badasses. And they are raging a war against the English like they've never seen. Because England had this powerful army. England had the most powerful army in Europe. Edward Longshanks had, you know, could just dominate his 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 fighting in, in France, had made his, his military genius superb. And luckily for us of Scottish descent, Edward finally would get old and die. Because if Edward had did this campaign in his, say, 30s or even mid-40s, I think we would have been in trouble. I, Edward Longshanks is probably the most despised, one of the most despised people in my, um, in, in, in my historical context. He is the great enemy. But I give him more credit given. This guy was a mastermind that had a military machine that was almost undefeatable. But... Andrew Murray, man, and William Wallace. These rebels, these Scottish patriots took it to them, and they understood they couldn't beat Edward's army head-on. So they did what they, that all true freedom fighters did, use things to their advantage. 
hit and run, ambush, lure in, trap, do things to throw off the mightier army. So this was the context of Stirling Bridge. They devised a plan to bog down the English cavalry, then force them to go over the old Stirling Bridge. Now, if you go over to the other side of this bridge, you will there are actually under the ground. I don't know if you can see them anymore, but when the when the river's low, there are at times that you can get down there and see them. But the columns of perhaps the original Stirling Bridge or the Stirling Bridge during William Wallace's time is still there on the other side of that bridge. This bridge, I believe, was built sometime in the early 1500s. But this is a decisive point. We talk about two big battles that changed things. Well, this changed everything with Edward the Longshanks. The Battle of Stirling Bridge made the Scots legitimate, and it made William Wallace and Andrew Murray, household names, made these guys the heroes of Scotland with their armies of lowland Scots, highland Scots, just put them in great position to kick the English's ass. Unfortunately, Andrew Murray may be a bigger name than, than William Wallace or even Robert the Bruce had he lived. Unfortunately, he was would, would end up getting killed. And he... And if I'm mis not mistaken, I think he, he was killed on the battlefield or maybe he was wounded and, and died afterwards. I don't really remember, and I should because I really like Andrew Murray. I don't know why it's slipping me because there's so many great people um, in, in, in Scottish history um, that, that have died in battle. But he would, be, he would die before the campaign um, was over. And so William Wallace would step up without this guy and lead the charge. And it was right here at Stirling Bridge that William Wallace and Andrew Murray took it to the English. God, just standing there looking at this river and knowing that the English were on one side and the, and the Scots were on the other. The superior army versus these tacticians, these vicious and driven patriots. Uh, it doesn't get any better than that. I might have got carried away a little bit there. Uh, there's there's William Wall uh, the the Wallace Monument, and actually we were gonna go up the monument that day. And, and this is a little pub called the William Wallace. It's a nice little place. Pop in and um, get you a little pub food and, and get you a pint. I do recommend it. Uh, so we're going up to Wallace um, Tower. This is the monument. Uh, National uh, National Wallace Monument, and we didn't realize that it was as late as it was. And there I am, taking it to the English. And look, hey guys, look, there's Sterling Bridge, and I am assuming that the cavalry is the English. I don't know, but there I am, ready to give it to the English. So we get there, and the doors closed. Uh, and the, the gates pulled down, and I was like, ah. But, eh, we made it that far. There's Shannon giving it to the English. Uh, and there's another Wallace pub. There's several little things around that. Um, but, yeah, so... We go from Stirling Castle, we go to the Kirkyard, we see all the Reformation Scots... Love them or hate them. Uh, and then we make our way down um, to Stirling Bridge. We cross the river. Then we go up to the Wallace, uh, the Wallace Monument. Unfortunately, it was closed. Uh, unlike the castle, we were actually going to go up the Wallace Monument. Now, we're going to go to the place. When we talk about William Wallace's legacy and we talk about the Battle of Stirling Bridge, well... This place will make the hair on the back of your neck stand because this place is where the younger Edward's main military might would meet the forces of Robert the Bruce in a clash 
of all clashes. This single battle may be the most important battle in the history of Scottish independence. Can you guess where we're going with this? Well, if you're a true Scotsman or you have Scottish in your ancestry, or if you know a little tiny bit about Scottish history, you should know what I'm talking about. Yep. Think about it. This is Bannockburn. This is where the Battle of Bannockburn, where Robert the Bruce took it to the English army and won a battle that would forever change the fight for Scottish independence. And this is on the this is on a one of the monument pieces. It says for God and St. Andrew, Robert the Bruce, King of Scots, planted his standard near this spot when the Scottish Patriots under his command vanquished vanquished the army of Edward II of England at the Battle of Bannockburn. 24th of June, 1314. We fight not for glory, nor for wealth, nor honor, but only and alone we fight for freedom, which no good man surrenders but with his life. Now understand this, that the colonists that lived in America that fought against the British, that fought against the crown for their independence in the United States, would look back at battles like this between the Scots and the English, the crown. And these quotes and these proclamations, and it would feed into this. Now, most of the fighters for the United States were Scotsmen or Scots-Irish and Irish. And there it is, the legendary Robert the Bruce himself on horseback. I'm going to say this to all of my American friends. If you think Robert the Bruce was some weak, coward, weasel that Braveheart, the movie with Mel Gibson, portrays him at, you're dead wrong. You better go look at your history. Robert the Bruce was none of those things. In fact, he was the real Braveheart. William Wallace was never called Braveheart, but... I love William. I love the Wallace. He's just as equal to me as Robert the Bruce. And here's some more around Bannockburn. And you just gotta love the statue. Right there on the field. Right there where many Scotsmen shed blood to free, to keep free, to fight for freedom. For all the peoples. Lowlanders. Uplanders. Highlanders, Islanders, Hebrideans, Orkneyans, all of them. And there he is, Robert the King of Scots, 1306 to his death in 1329. This is one of my most favorite statues in the world because it's sitting on such a sacred spot at Bannockburn. I don't care how many times I go to Scotland. I don't care how many times I'm close to Bannockburn. If I'm within an hour, I'll probably travel here and walk the grounds. Because it has a pronounced... This is a profound effect, this battle. And, and our heritage, my heritage, your heritage, is if you have Scottish heritage... Would, would be completely different had Robert felled that day at Bannockburn. Scotland could have been in another colony of the English. It could have turned into what a lot of Ireland turned into. See, Scotland avoided all that, per se, what happened with the Jacobites and the Highland clearances, which was just as bad it would happen in Ireland. But, while Ireland would gradually lose, lose more and more autonomy. And the English would become more and more powerful and dominating. Their cousins, the Scots, would remain free. 
all the way up until the 1600s. And Stuart King took the throne of England. And unfortunately, I wish that would have never happened, but it did. But they were still strong and independent until the Union of Crowns. And then after that, the, the formation of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. But we're talking about Robert the Bruce the, and the true Scotland. There I am. And this is, I love this picture because it's, you see dusk is coming and it's just a really good contrast. If you're ever in Scotland, central Scotland, anywhere near Edinburgh, Stirling, Glasgow, um, uh, you know, anywhere near these places, um, you've got to go to Benner Rockburn. You know, walking these grounds made me want to grab a claymore and go to war. For freedom, that is. If need be. Alright, so we go from um, Bannockburn and we go down to a castle. And this is Dune Castle. Now, Dune Castle is... If you don't know your history, then you probably recognize this by a show called Outlander, based on a series of books. Now, Outlander has made Scottish history to some degree, I guess. The Jacob Black Halls and the clans, and a few of the clans' names, such as the McKinsey's and the Frasers and so forth. Um, so... Outlander is really, you know, around the world, especially in the United States and Canada, Australia, English-speaking countries, um, has really brought a big light to um, to Scottish history and the clansmen and the Highlanders and Jacobites. But this is a castle. Now, this this is Dune Castle, um, and this is the real history. It has nothing to do with the Highlanders at all. It doesn't have anything to do with... Um, the McKenzie's or the Frasers or anybody in that show, it's all fictitious with a little bit of truth when they're talking about the struggles of the Jacobites against um, the crown. Uh, but we're going to go back. Now, that this is Dune Castle, okay? And this was built, I believe, around the 1400s, and it was built by Robert Stewart. Now, Robert Stewart is the Duke of Albany, now, this guy was not kin. This, this Duke of Albany, I don't, I don't believe that he was a son of the king, but he was part of the stewards of Scotland that served all of the Scottish kings. These guys came over from uh, Brittany, over in France, but at this time it was a dukedom. And they came over with William the Conqueror and the Normans. And there they would come into England. And from there they would go with David's entourage up into... You know, David was actually a Scottish prince, but he had lived several years, uh, probably his teenage years, in England. So he was, he was reared up uh, around this French-speaking uh, Norman court. And he would arrive into Scotland to take his throne. And with him he would bring... Um, the the possibly the Colemans, the Frasers, the De Bruces, uh, the Montgomerys, the Saint Clairs, the Ramses. So the Bollies, he would bring all these guys up here, and they would introduce feudalism, Norman feudalism, into Scotland, and this would also spark this great castle building era from the 1100s all the way through the 1600s. So going back to Robert Stewart, the Duke of Albany, he is a descendant of the Stuarts that served as high stewards of Scotland, served all these kings from D, you know, David and um, 
William and Alexander and so forth. And it would be the sixth great steward of Ireland that would marry the daughter of Robert de Bruce. And after Robert de Bruce's son died, it would be this individual's son, Robert II, that would become king. But we're jumping ahead of ourselves. We're getting back to Doom Castle. This is Doom Castle. It was built sometime in the 1400s by Robert Stewart. But if you watch High, uh, if you watch Outlander, um, there it is. Now the very top of the castle in Outlander is is not in run. They probably used um, CGI to make it look like the, the castle was all um, there up on the top. But it, it's a pretty nice castle to go to. Um, you At the time, you couldn't go into it. At one time, you could go into it, so I don't know if they have it open to the public again or not. Um, you know, when we went to this area... Um, Outlander, um, I, I don't know how big Outlander was, but when I went here, and this was in 2016, when I went and visited um, um, the castle, Doom Castle, I knew the history of Doom Castle and Robert and the Stewart family and all that, because I have probably four to five different Stewarts married into both my father and my mother's lines, and several of these go back to Robert the Bruce. Some of them don't even go back to Robert the Bruce. They kind of circle around him, and they go back to um, high stewards. Some of them go back to James IV, who was the king of Scotland, who was, you know, a great-great-great-grandson of Robert the Bruce. Um, but anyways, when I went here and saw this, I, I had no idea that this was in um, the Outlander show. But they have did some restoration work on it. And I imagine that this would have had a wall encircling this. So this is a this is like a massive tower house. Most castles don't have tower houses this massive and tall. But this is not the actual castle itself. This is the inner castle. This is the the castle house, I guess you would say, or castle tower. It's the keep. That's the word I'm looking for. This is the keep of the castle. And it, it, it's it's rather large um, for a singular structure. Most castles have several different structures in them with the main keep. And this one's pretty big. And it would have had a... Um, I'd venture to say this castle was probably at least six stories high um, in height. Maybe not levels. I, I don't know how many levels it had. But it's at least six plus stories high at the, at the main section of it, the tallest section. But it would have walls around it. And it would be centered right in the middle of on the small crag or hill side. And um yeah, like I said it was it was it used to be open back then. They were it was closed on this visit. Um we wouldn't have had a chance to go in because it it closed, I believed it um, 5.30, and this was around, I believe this was around 6, because this was in, I believe, late August, early September, so this would have been um, around 6 or 7 o'clock. So this is, this is a video photo tour of a trip that we took from the Isle of Sky, which we left at 6 o'clock, and we woke up around 4.30 in the morning, we got on the road at 6 o'clock, Drove, we were staying, um, I'm trying to remember where we were staying. It was not too far from Edinbane, um, so Dunvegan area. So we drove around south of Dunvegan and, and crossed all the way to the uh, past Carbost and all that. And we're going through and we, we cross Isle of Skye, get back on the mainland. We pass Ellen Dunn Castle. Uh, we had actually stopped up on, at the castle on the way up. Um, but this is all in one day from six o'clock in the morning to about six o'clock in the afternoon. This is 12 hours. Now, of course we stopped and had breakfast. We stopped, had lunch, had a drink 
and then we stopped for dinner. Um, and you would think, like, going all the way from the Isle of Skye all the way to Stirling and Dune Castle, you would think, man, that, and stopping all these places would be a massive um, tiring event, but it wasn't. Because, um, you know, like I said, we crossed over, stopped at some battlefields um, in Glen Chill. We went to um, travel through um, Glen Glow. We went to Bal uh, Witter and, and looked at Robert, our, uh, Rob Roy McGregor's grave. Um, from there, we went up to Sterling Castle, looked at the Kirkyard below the castle. Then we went over to um, Sterling Bridge, uh, the famous battle. Then we went over to Wash, uh, Wallace's Monument. And, and then we ended up at Dune Castle. So this was probably roughly 10 hours, 12 hours. And... Drive time was probably about, I want to say the drive time was about five hours. But we never drove more than about 45 minutes to an hour at a time. So everywhere we stopped was within 30 to 45 minutes of each other. And, you know, we ended up staying the night in Sterling. Um, on this particular trip, we went to, from there, we went over to, we went down to Glasgow I did a couple things on one day. Then the next day we went to Edinburgh. Um, and the next day after that we went down to Roslyn Chapel. Um, and then we went down to Temple Church. Now Temple Church is really cool because it has a lot of history to the Knights Templar. And then from there we went to the, Cal uh, the Castle Dalhousie, or Dalhus. Um, and there is the seat of the Earls of Dalhus. And that's the Ramses, and on you know on my mother's side, on her mother's mother, my my great grandmother was a Ramsey, that were descendants of Alexander Ramsey, that were direct line descendants of the earls that built that castle, so that's cool. But but this is all one day trip, um, and it was very relaxing. I mean we. I don't think we were in a hurry at all. We took our time. We stopped at the sites. We looked. We took pictures. Um, and and then we stopped at, you know, different pubs along the way and, and, and had a bite to eat. But these are some ideas that if you go to Scotland and you've never been, this these are things you can do. Now, I'm from Texas where Texas is bigger than all of Scotland, England, Wales, and Ireland together. You could literally put, you know, you know, you could, you could literally put like four or five Britons inside of Texas is how big we are here in Texas. So it's nothing to drive a couple of hours um, and, and see a lot of events or a lot of historical um, structures and spots and beautiful, amazing landscapes. So... Um, most people would never have driven from the Isle of Skye all the way um, to Sterling and stopped at six or seven spots. And actually, I believe we stopped probably at more spots than this. It's just these were only the only pictures I wanted to show at this time. So um, hope you enjoyed this. A little bit of history, a little bit of sightseeing. And if you're in the region... Um, you know, Isle of Skye is beautiful. I have many pictures of that, and I've explored every square mile on the Isle of Skye. Um, I might post some videos of that and, and, and go over some of that history. But, you know, hopefully you've learned a little bit about um, the Jacobites. You've learned a little bit about Robert the Bruce and Andrew Murray and William Wallace and John Coleman and what some of these structures were and how things like Braveheart are so wrong in every aspect nearly except that they did portray William Wallace as a legitimate badass and he wasn't a hero and I love the movie by the way I love the movie Rory, Rory McGregor but there's a little bit of things wrong in that but they were right with their perception of the Campbells and so forth uh, but I love that movie too Outlander I, I, I've watched the first two seasons of Outlander, and I've never watched it again, but um, that's just, you know, ficti fictitious writing, but it seemed kind of cool. I like the concept. 
Um, but it does give you a little bit of the history of the Jacob Bites. Um, so, but anyways, you're in Scotland. You're around these places. Check it out. The incredible thing is there are literally hundreds of landscapes and historic monuments and battlefields and castles and kirks and graveyards to visit that are all within typically an hour from any central point where you're at. So, anyways, thanks for watching. I'm Jonah McTavish Slayton, and this is my channel.